Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, and thank you for joining this month's Schools Out, Foods In webinar, Engage Community Leaders to Strengthen Your Summer Meals Program. Uh, a couple of housekeeping items before we begin. If you're having any problems today with an audio connection uh, or seeing the screen, please go ahead and send those in via the question box in the panel on the right hand of the screen. We'll also be answering questions uh, during the webinar today with our panelists, uh, but please don't wait. Go ahead and chat those questions in in our question box throughout the webinar, and we'll get to those uh, in the order they were received. There are a lot of folks on the phone today, so if we aren't able to get to your question, we will follow up with you by email after the fact. Uh, also a reminder that a recording of this webinar and a copy of slides will be sent to all registrants after the webinar, uh, and so you can keep an eye out for that in the days ahead as well. Uh, so again, thanks everyone. Uh, looking toward our next slide, uh, we're gonna dive right in. And I just wanna take a moment and let folks know that this is our final webinar of the monthly Schools Out Foods In webinar series. We started back in January. Uh, and today, June 13th, will be our final webinar. Uh, we will, at the end of the webinar today, go over uh, some of the ways that you can go back and listen to those. There's actually a link that you can go back and listen to a recording of all of those slides all those webinars and download the slide decks. Uh, however, today we're gonna to be talking about engaging community leaders to strengthen summer meals, which is a great topic and very timely as summer meals have either just gotten underway or will be getting started any day now uh, around the country. So we are going to uh, talk about the goals and the background of community leader engagement. We've got two great examples and stories from Virginia and California that will shine a light on today uh, with our panelists uh, who I will soon introduce. Uh, and then also we're gonna share some resources on keys to effective engagement. And again, just as a reminder for those of you on the line, uh, we are looking for your questions and excited to share those with attendees. Uh, so please don't hesitate, uh, as you can see on the next slide, to chat those in, uh, looking at the uh, questions box. Uh, you can write those in and send that in to us and we will ask those of our panelists today. Great, so let's go ahead and get started on the next slide. And when we're thinking about engaging community leaders who can include elected officials, we know there's a lot of benefits that we'll get into, but really fundamentally, the goal when trying to engage partners around this work is to have them take, have the right people take the right action at the right time. And generally our goals around this are to uh, expand access to summer meals, increase the profile of these programs, and make it easier for families and children to participate uh, in locations and at times and in places and ways that are convenient to them, and that also reduce stigma that may sometimes be associated with the program. So on the next slide, we'll talk about, you know, what is some of the background for this topic before we dive into the meat of our content? You know, there's a real opportunity to engage co community leaders who have a powerful role uh, and who, who actually occupy uh, a place of, uh, of trust in the community. They, uh, whether it's elected officials, whether it's faith community leaders, superintendents or school district leaders, these are, are folks, these are names, these are institutions that families trust in the community and they can play a powerful role in connecting their constituents with information about summer meals and also uh, provide a powerful uh, outlet for word of mouth which we know is one of the most powerful ways to promote the program. You know, No Kid Hungry has a summer meals texting hotline. Uh, we try to promote that and we hope to embed that in outreach in as many ways as we can. There are other resources that lots of folks use to promote the program. We know that at the end of the day, word of mouth is a really powerful tool and the community leaders are great vehicles for information about summer meals. And in many ways, they may be underutilized resources. We can operate in silos sometimes and so, by getting outside of those silos and educating our leaders about the issue of summer hunger, uh, connecting with them to resources that they can use, as clear asks with easy resources that they can plug and play with, uh, they can be built as champions to help end childhood hunger in the summer months and also raising awareness about the important programs uh, like summer meals that we work on and that, we, that other families may not be aware of. And again, these folks come from across the spectrum. These can be leaders, elected leaders in government, uh, whether that's at the state or the local levels. Uh, it can be through, uh, it can be faith leaders, it can be school district. There are all kinds of folks in the community that folks look to for information. And by providing those leaders with clear asks and actionable resources, they can be our partners in getting the, the information out. Now there is an investment, right? We have to have resources that are ready to use, 
We have to make, uh, we have to provide a timeline for action. Uh, fortunately, we've got some resources we're gonna share with you today to hopefully make that easier. But really the primary investment is one of time, cultivating relationships of trust, articulating those asks and prov providing support to community leaders who can help us deliver on shared goals. Again, which is uh, cultivating trust around summer meals, helping raise public awareness, and doing uh, their part to help reduce stigma and encourage participation over the course of the summer. Uh, and there are real tangible benefits to these investments. And as we can see on the next slide, we have an example from Virginia that we're gonna highlight. Uh, and to kick that off, I'm really thrilled to introduce my colleague, Sarah Steely, who's a program senior program manager for No Kid Hungry Virginia. Uh, in this role, Sarah liaises with statewide stakeholders, coordinates team communications and goals, and develops data-informed engagement strategies to increase awareness of and access to the federally reimbursed school nutrition programs, including summer meals. Since the start of her involvement with the summer program in 2016, Virginia has continued to grow its number of summer meal sites, school division sponsors, meals served, and enrichment and community partnerships. And Sarah, we're just thrilled to have you with us today uh, and to hear about some of the great work that you've been doing on municipal engagement around summer meals. Thank you, Derek, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm so excited to be here with you today to share a few top level details about outreach to local leaders in Virginia because for many years we have prioritized our municipal influencers as a key stakeholder group for outreach and that approach continues to grow and it continues to surprise us each year. So next slide, in particular, I, I really wanna highlight some special work happening in Richmond, Virginia. So let's quickly set the stage with a few key factors that made Richmond a strong candidate for a municipal outreach strategy. Kind of that right people, right action, right time concept that Derek was just talking about. So key factor number one, Richmond is the state capital. So there's a lot of eyes on it and a lot of influence you know, throughout the state. And while it's not the largest city in Virginia, it does boast approximately 225,000 residents. So a large population to serve with this program. It has 44 schools and over 23,000 students. 100% of whom receive uh, free school breakfast and lunch through the community eligibility provision. And it's also the largest city in Virginia to reach our statewide goal of 70% of free and reduced lunch eaters also eating breakfast at school. So we know already that child nutrition programs are an important resource for those students and families. Next slide. Key factor number two is that uh, Richmond Mayor LeVar Stoney has been at the helm of the city since December 2016, and he is a proud champion for Richmond, and he has a noteworthy resume in state and local government. In his public remarks, Mayor Stoney has been vocal about being raised uh, by a single parent and about uh, counting on free and reduced school meals growing up. So as a result, he has used his mayoral platform to raise awareness about issues related to food access and out of school time programming. And next slide, please. Key factor number three is that Richmond is lucky to already have a really strong existing summer meals program supported by a number of veteran sponsors represented on the logos here, including Richmond Public Schools, Feed More, the local food bank, and the Richmond Department of Parks, Recreation and Community Facilities the last of which has been providing summer meals in, in some capacity or another for the last 40 years. So these organizations are amazing. They serve hundreds of thousands of meals across hundred sites in Richmond. But as we know, every summer meals program in every corner of the nation has the opportunity to improve. And we know we have great, spon uh, great sponsors and great personnel in these organizations to keep advancing that goal. So all three of these factors led us to pursue a more thoughtful outreach strategy with Mayor Stoney, next slide. And he summed up the strategy really well in this quote, and you, you'll see that it's from an, an interest webinar from last year. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But he says it here, he recognizes the mayor's responsibility, the mayor's office, the city agencies, and their role in promoting programs that reduce the burden of food insecurity on our families and children. So our coordination with Mayor Stoney and his office began in 2017 with a series of in-person and electronic conversations. And in this particular instance, we were very fortunate to be able to leverage an existing contact 
uh, an existing connection with one of the staff members in the mayor's office. But we were so excited and surprised by the scope of the conversation. They were really organic, they were creative, and they demonstrated this really high, holistic level of interest from the mayor's office in unlocking multiple opportunities for support across the city, city government. Next slide. So a really natural start to the summer and a very highly recommended tactic for anyone thinking about mayoral outreach was Mayor Stoney's uh, participation and appearance at a Parks and Recreation summer kickoff event. So he requested the attendance of his police chief and together you can see in this picture, they served meals alongside of our former first lady of Virginia, Dorothy McAuliffe, along with uh, representatives from various city offices and really announced that start of the Summer Meals Program in 2017 with this amazing, fun celebration. Next slide. But the support from both the mayor and the police chief did not end there. So the mayor's office was upfront about wanting to continue those visits throughout the summer. They requested additional opportunities um, for the mayor to squeeze in a stop at a breakfast or lunch site if and when his schedule allowed. So we kept them up to date on, on those opportunities and compared with the kickoff event, this visit at Randolph Community Center, one of the municipally run community centers in Richmond, it was a low lift event. You know, it was no frills. It was shorter. It didn't you know, have as much fanfare associated with it, but it was a really quality opportunity for the mayor to get out, help serve meals, and to spend time with the kids. Next slide. So through encouragement from the mayor's office and leadership from the police chief, um, the police department as a whole had a recurring presence at five of Richmond Housing Authority's summer meal sites. These were actually housing complexes where officers would go and assist with meal service. They would facilitate group activities, you know, like pick up basketball games, that sort of thing. And then they also publicized the program through their routine community outreach, the sort of um, officers that are, you know, already visiting the neighborhood, interacting with residents, keeping flyers, promotional flyers in the trunk of their car, be able to pass out and promote as they were interacting with folks. Next slide. So these trends, this was all 2017. I'm so thrilled that they continued into 2018 with Mayor Stoney, Stoney appearing again last summer at a July spike event. So different than a kickoff, I'm sure y'all are familiar, meant to keep the public's attention as those long summer days drag on and it gets hotter. Um, but at this event, Mayor Stoney issued a proclamation declaring the week of July 9th through 13th Summer Meals Action Week in Richmond. And our team was involved in that. We were able to provide some draft language of the mayor's office customized and printed with the official seal and presented to Parks and Recreation as a thank you for their continued commitment to the program because they do such extraordinary work. Next slide. So these public visits were important for a number of reasons. They gave the mayor an opportunity to see these important programs in action and to support the city employees that make them happen. They gave the kids and teens an opportunity to interact with this young, dynamic public official. And of course, they attracted media attention. So I love some dramatic animation on PowerPoint, and that's what I'm highlighting here. These are all separate headlines from the events that I just talked about over the last couple of slides, because where the mayor goes, the media follows, which means that our summer meals message was further amplified as the residents of Richmond were turning on their evening news or opening up the morning papers the next day. And I'm so proud of that, um, that, that picture of the newspaper front page above the fold. You know, I bought a dozen copies. I felt like a, a proud parent, but what amazing coverage that highlighted not just the program in Richmond, but also in the surrounding suburbs as well. So really great coverage there. Next slide. And this is uh, this media coverage is demonstrable in the way that the 877-877 text food texting number spiked on the day of the spike event, the most literal hope for that event. Um, uh, you know, you can see on July 9th with that arrow right there that the number of interactions with the text line in Virginia jumped up from what had otherwise been kind of a downward lull in the second half of the summer. So what a great opportunity to refresh folks' memories that this program is available to them. Next slide, please. 
So as I mentioned before, Mayor Stoney's support of the program unlocked additional opportunities for municipal promotion, and he involved city council, the Department of Social Services, the library system, the transit system, the police department, and these are all contacts that we otherwise might not have been able to make with these entities and outreach strategies that we replicated with those groups across the Commonwealth. Next slide. So while this is a, that Richmond story was a specific example of a confluence of key factors in one city in Virginia leading to successful municipal engagement, I wanted to share four ideas that I think transcend city lines, they transcend state lines, and could unlock some opportunities for you and your organization's summer meals program. So the first is send an email. So last year, our team took to the internet to acquire the emails for state and local lawmakers. And we actually pulled those from individual city websites, individual lawmaker websites, and we were able to amass a list of contact information, which we used at the beginning of the summer to uh, send out a message to these elected officials, encouraging them to promote the program. And we offered just a couple key ways in which they could do that, and we received visit requests from over a dozen lawmakers hoping to see a program in their jurisdiction, and we were able to link them up with the local sponsors to make that happen. And then we noticed that dozens of other of our elected officials posted about the program on their social media and were able to interact with their constituents through that post. So this is a really low lift, zero cost tactic that had a really high and surprising ROI for us. And this would be a great project for an intern, um, you know, or, a, or some sort of summer employee maybe that needs a specific special project to work on. Uh, what better way than to put them on amassing this awesome contact list. And so we also do physical mail mailers, just spotlighting on the snail, snail mail. This year we mailed flyers and posters to over 150 local WIC and social services offices. So this is a medium lift, can be higher cost depending on if you already have the materials available and how far you're sending them. Um, but this ensures that our target audience, our food insecure families and kids, will be seeing information about the summer meals program while they're interacting with other support services. Sending an invitation. I think this is like, you know, a call to be bold. Don't be afraid to extend, extend an invitation directly to your local community leaders, whether um, you're hosting a kickoff event or you're just hoping that they'll come out and visit a routine meal site on a normal day. And in my experience, if you give them enough notice and if their schedule allows, our community leaders have been excited and willing to participate in these events and these visits because they're good news, feel good stories. And also be thoughtful about who's doing the inviting, right? Sometimes it's not appropriate for me from 25 counties away to be sending the invite, but maybe having someone who actually lives, works, breathes, plays, shops in the community extend that invite and or do it together to further amplify the importance of that community leader's presence at the meal site. Partner with a municipal association. So of the four of these, I think this is the one that's most exciting to me. Get in touch with one of your membership organizations that represent locally elected officials. So here in Virginia, we engage with the Virginia Municipal League and the Virginia Association of Counties. And they have newsletters and websites and social media pages that they want to fill with information for their readers, for their captive audience of these locally elected officials who receive those publications. And it was actually through um, partnerships with the Virginia Municipal League and the Virginia Association of Counties that we were able to host that Summer Meals Interest webinar that I mentioned. It was short, just 30 minutes, an opportunity for Mayor Stoney to provide some inspiration and his perspective on why his peers in other counties and cities should be promoting the Summer Meals program. And then an opportunity for No Kid Hungry Virginia to provide a few key ways in which the attendees could support the pro their program in their locality. And we recorded that webinar. It lives on the Municipal League and Association of Counties website, along with a local government toolkit, which is similar to a resource that Derek is going to promote at the end of this webinar. And then lastly, attend a conference. If your funds, if your time allows, those uh, membership organizations often have an annual conference which could be a great opportunity to interact with some of your local community leaders, kind of when they're off the clock, maybe not in their suits, rushing around from one event to another, 
Um, but if you wanted to perhaps purchase an exhibit booth or attend yourself and use that time to develop relationships, deepen your bench of champions, have some strategic conversations, those conferences, at least for us in Virginia, have proven to be a really fruitful opportunity. So last slide, please. I wanted to close with this quote from Mayor Stoney because I do appreciate his call to action for elected officials to engage in summer meals promotion, but I, I think that we as anti-hunger advocates have to roll our sleeves up even higher, if that's possible. But I think that we have a lot of work to do on the front end of this outreach to curate those intentional events, to extend invitations, to mail outreach materials, to draft those social media posts and proclamation language uh, so that our community leaders have all the resources that they need knowing that their schedules are very full and that they're pulled in lots of different uh, directions, um, but making it as easy as possible for them to lend their voices and support. Because ultimately, doing that work on the front end will pay off when those local leaders amplify our message. They broaden the audience and make it clear, uh, you know, particularly in Virginia, to everyone that summer meals are a vital resource for strong communities and for successful students. So with that, Derek, I will turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Sarah. This is a great example of engagement, and I like your, your point about rolling our sleeves up even higher. Doing some of that, you know, laying the groundwork for these elected officials to be engaged really creates opportunities for them to do so and makes it easier for them to actually think about, well, how can I carve time out of my busy schedule to be a part of this because you've made that ask as easy to fulfill as possible. Um, and then you talked about some of the benefits in terms of, you know, getting elected officials to the table or to sites is also a great way to generate media coverage, which helps raise awareness of the program. So that's, that's really, those are great points that you made. We had a quick question, Emily, from Helenka. Um, is there a shareable template available uh, from that first summer email that went out to elected officials? Is, is there any copy um, that you would recommend? Uh, where did you pull that from? Or is that something that you might be able to share some of the language with some of our attendees following this event? Absolutely. I'm sure that we based it off of existing materials, but it was something that we created in-house in Virginia. So Derek, I'll share that with you so you can share it with others after the webinar. That sounds great. And Helenka uh, and others on the line as well, um, what we'll do when we send out the recording and the link to the webinar uh, that will be on our website, we can include resources such as this uh, and also a video that we'll be uh, hearing about uh, later on from our colleagues in California. And Sarah, we may have some additional questions for you if you don't mind hanging around with us for the rest of the webinar, but we are going to go ahead and transition uh, over to uh, our folks in California if that works. We're Great. Ready. Yeah, so um, for this, we really, on the next slide, we're going to be uh, shining a spotlight on some work that's been happening in California and specifically in the capital area around Sacramento. Um, and we have a great trio of speakers with us today uh, who I'll briefly introduce and then they will uh, share their stories as well. Uh, the work that they've done individually and as a team uh, and as a collaborative effort in that area. So we'll start. We'll, first, we'll hear from Maria Donis, who is a program manager uh, with the Bay Area in Sacramento in No Kid Hungry, California, uh, which is the state campaign of No Kid Hungry in the state. Uh, Mariela uh, has over 15 years of experience developing programs that improve the lives of children and their families. Prior to coming to Share Our Strength, she was the Senior Director for Girls, Inc. of Alameda County, where she oversaw all aspects of their nationally utilized literacy and STEM after-school, summer, and school day programs. Her experience also includes managing federally funded literacy programs at Catholic Charities of Santa Clara County. While originally from Guatemala, she grew up in the Bay Area and attended local public schools. Uh, we'll also then hear from Karen Abrego, representative and community liaison for Dr. Richard Pan, California State Senator of the 6th District, which covers Sacramento and Yolo Counties. Karen serves as a program manager and community liaison for California uh, Senator Pan. In this capacity, she serves as a member of the Sacramento Region Summer Meal Collaborative, which was formed by the United Way California Capital Region in 2016 to bring together partners to raise awareness of summer meals and increase participation in the program. Karen was a featured contributor on the Capital Public Radio NPR program, Hidden Hunger in Sacramento, and also serves as a community outreach pastor at the Avenue Church in Sacramento, as well as a board member of the Community Resource Project. 
And finally, we'll hear from Vince Coggin, Director of Nutrition Services and Warehousing at Natomas Unified School District, uh, where he is the Director of Nutrition Services, uh, and he oversees the service of breakfast, lunch, supper, and summer meals. He is a former academic department chair at Le Cordon Bleu, Los Angeles, and currently he is an instructor, proctor, and item writer for the National Restaurant Association Education Foundation and a consultant trainer for the Institute of Child Nutrition. Uh, so we have a great panel from California today. And to kick it off, I'm going to hand over to my colleague at No Kid Hungry California, uh, Mariela Doniz. Mariela, take it away. Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? You yeah. sound great. Great. So I'm going to first introduce um, California and why we're doing work here in California. And the slide here shows the very misleading map of California. The first thing you have to know is that it is very huge. We have nearly 7 million students here in California, over 1,000 uh, school districts. And in the area that I am focused on, which is Sacramento, one of the two areas that I have focus on, we have over 349 schools uh, serving over 150,000 students. So the area is so big. And so as I was starting my job here over a year ago, um, I really wanted to develop a strategy that allowed me to serve this great region. And one of my strategies was to first find and do some research around who is already doing work here in California, who has influence in Sacramento, and how can I then build a relationship, a mutually beneficial relationship with each of them so that they can invite me into their community and into, um, into working with them specifically around increasing breakfast. I quickly found out that here in Sacramento, breakfast was not the big priority, that summer was a huge priority for most of the influential members of the community. Um, initially, we started working in trying to develop a child hunger caucus with Senator Pan's office, and um, which is now the child caucus here in Sacramento County. And I met Karen Abrego. And Karen explained to me the, the need here in Sacramento for summer meals and how incredibly important it is to a lot of important stakeholders like Senator Pan and the nutrition directors who she was already working with because they were all members of um, a summer meals collaborative really focusing on making sure that we reached 100, um, served 100 meals over the summer months. I knew that this wasn't a huge priority, but I knew that this was going to be the way of um, making sure that we first knew more about the community that I was going to serve. And also, um, you know, I knew that it was gonna be the inn for breakfast because it really lend itself for, for the nutrition landscape here in Sacramento. So when I met with other um, stakeholders like Natomas and Elk Grove Unified, um, some of the most influential players here, I realized that they really had a need around, um, around serving meals and going out to students uh, because they were one of the few districts who were actually um, serving uh, larger communities. And so we were very excited to be able to invite them to apply to grants um, for summer uh, for a summer truck, which we were able to get them. And they're now in um, the area here in uh, Sacramento. Um, I think that we can go ahead and to the next slide. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the collaborative. Uh, we're very fortunate here in Sacramento where we have a lot of people interested in this. And if you look at the list, we are now um, a huge partner along with very influential um, nonprofits and uh, housing authorities here in Sacramento. And um, this has really excited everyone about breakfast. We are now partnering and I'm partnering with uh, Sac City, which has uh, 77 schools alone. And um, we're, having a formal partnership around breakfast and summer. So this really has been the way of tapping into the breakfast gap here in Sacramento, which is, by the way, the fifth largest in California alone. So one of the things that we're also trying to do here is 
um, we're trying to see how we can begin to talk about a larger breakfast strategy, not just with Sac City, but with other uh, members uh, here in Sacramento and um, Senator Pan and Karen, well, Karen specifically, who you will hear about, um, hear from next, is now a breakfast champion, a formal breakfast champion of ours. And she's introduced me to other key partners to, and has really, I think, changed um, a lot of people's perspective around the importance of breakfast. So what I'll do now is I'll go ahead and introduce Karen, and Karen will talk to you about how and why Senator Pan become, is interested in summer and also uh, the great events that uh, she's planned um, to engage him in community efforts around um, summer feeding. Thank you, Mariela. Um, happy Thursday, everybody. We almost have made it through another week. I want to give you a little bit of background as to how the senator became involved in this and why this is such a critical issue for him in his Senate district. Dr. Pan is indeed a doctor in addition to being a senator, and more than that, he's a pediatrician. And he's one of those type of people that when most of the rest of the senators fly home to their home districts on Thursday night after Senate has um, adjourned for the week, he is already home, so he continues to practice as a pediatrician at a local community health center on Friday afternoons when he's not otherwise obligated in Senate business. So he also, as a physician, is very data-driven in his decisions and in the plans and programs that he puts together. So when I came to work for him, after having worked as a, as a community liaison person in the community, um, I explained to him that there was a crisis going on in his district, and I told him that of the children that were receiving free and reduced meals during the academic year, that only 12% of them were being reached over the summer months. And so when I was able to provide him with the data and the background and the breakdown of where the pockets of high need and under-resourced were, he set a goal and a challenge for me and for his district to increase the number of meals that we were serving to children over the summer from approximately half a million to making it a million meal summer. We knew to do that, that we were going to have to engage more partners. And fortunately, because he is so respected in the community, when I would meet with um, people that were looking to partner with his office on community outreach events, and I explained to them the data, we sealed some more relationships working towards this common goal than we had ever seen before. The Dentical folks, the um, low-cost, low-income dental services here in California, came to the office and said that their reach was not what they wanted it to be amongst the most high-need individuals. How could they partner with us to connect with more of the families that needed to utilize their service? We're in the process of planning. Last year we did it. We're going to repeat it again this year, what I call pop-up events, which is where we engage with these partners, take their resources out to the community, bringing dental vans, medical vans, bookmobiles, Vision to Learn, which is the Medi-Cal um, eyeglass company for the state, bringing them all out to these places and then flyering the neighborhood the week before this specific event and watch the people come in and take advantage of these services and also learn about the programming going on at the, at the site and the uh, summer meals and breakfast meals that are available to them through these programs that they never knew before. We call summer meals the best kept secret here in Sacramento. Now, one of the things we did through the collaborative a couple of years ago, Sac City School District prides itself on the fact that it is so diverse they have 46 different languages represented alone in the Sacramento City School District. Yet our flyers and our information were only available in English and Spanish, which it's great to have the Spanish, but we identified the next eight most popular languages and translated the 877 information into those languages. County Department of Public Health printed the posters for us for free. We then went out and targeted the neighborhoods using the places where the people that would need this program would frequent the most. Wick stores, laundromats, carnicerias, ethnic special markets, asking them if they would put the flyers up in their windows. 
we had a five-fold increase in the use of the 877 number that summer, and it didn't cost us a dime, just by putting it in multiple languages. The reason I knew that this was such an issue here in Sacramento is that when I moved here a decade ago from the Bay Area and became the pastor at this local church, um, I'm the associate, I couldn't figure out why the kids were not more engaged in what was going on on a given Sunday. So when it came to the first Easter that I was there, I asked the moms to help me serve the kids silver dollar pancakes. And I put some blueberries on them, and I walked around making sure that they weren't making their pancakes swim in syrup, and asking the kids if they needed help cutting their pancakes. While I was doing that, I began to hear a noise in the room. And that noise was children going, mm, mm. I recognized that noise. I had heard that noise when I did my missions work in El Salvador for eight years, and I would feed a special soup mixture provided by Feed My Starving Children to malnourished children in El Salvador. And as soon as they swallowed that soup, they made that sound. And it was that day that the light bulb went on that the kids at my church were the food poor here in Sacramento, and we had to turn this around. The senator understands the impact of this as a pediatrician because when a child is undernourished, it impacts their growth, their physical development, their learning development, the learning loss is impacted, and this is a cumulative situation. In other words, every summer that they are without proper nutrition, it gets worse and worse and worse. We have a great partnership with the libraries here in our community. They started out with three sites a few years ago, 14 sites of libraries, and they're one of our major service providers. Our school districts do an amazing job with their meals. And they, you're going to meet my superhero Vince in just a minute here, but they do an amazing job of setting up community picnics and things of that nature. So we took all of these strengths and all of these abilities by all these other partners that were out there working in silos and asked them to come together. And we built this collaborative from a group of about six to eight people to now we have actually 30, 35 people coming to meetings. Those, the Dentical folks are there. The house, voucher assisted housing apartment representatives are there. All kinds of folks that can contribute in one form or another to helping to build this program. As a result of that, since 2016, we are one of two places in the state, and you saw how big this state is with Mariela's slides, we are one of two that has not only had increases for two years in a row, but we've increased the number of meals towards our million meal goal by 20% in only two years. When you have a collaborative of talented people working together and you empower them to do what they do best, it works. So we, um, let me see, I had some other things. Oh, what are the other things that we bring to each of our pop-up events? We work with our local food bank. We know that one of every four of our children here in Sacramento region is food insecure, and one of every six adults are food insecure. So we work with our local food bank, and they drop off produce, and we provide produce to that under-resourced community as well, because unfortunately we have a number of food deserts in these um, under-resourced neighborhoods where folks don't have an access on a regular basis to fresh fruits and vegetables. So in a nutshell, as a result of this work that we've been doing, this year the mayor has come on board, city council members have come on board, school districts have posted all of the open feeding sites on their web pages. Last year school board members, and again this year, made robocalls to their school districts. Our law enforcement people have become engaged. Our sheriff's department drives around neighborhoods using their PA system, telling kids to follow them to a free lunch. And we have found that our wraparound programming, the things that we do to keep the kids engaged, is what keeps the kids coming back. We do the pop-up events in the month of July because, as Sarah pointed out, things tend to start taking a downward trend, and we have found that the pop-up events bring people back. I gave you a whole lot of information and not a whole lot of time, so if there's follow-up questions, I will stay on the line to help with them. But now I want to introduce you to Vince Kagan, 
my superhero, uh, food service director for Natoma School District, who is leading the way in amazing things. Thank you, Karen. Welcome, Vince. <laughs> I'm Vince Coggan with Natomas Unified School District, and my story with summer feeding at Natomas began seven years ago, 2012. Uh, although I knew there was a lot of hungry kids uh, in the neighborhood, in the community that we serve, the um, question comes about in 2012, which is, what kid would go out in like 105 degree weather uh, to get a summer meal, breakfast or lunch? And in 2012, that answer was about 400 kids a day. So eight sites, 400 meals a day. As, the, um, as that started to take a toll on my heart and where my passion is, um, I think my ability to ask questions, uh, my ability to ask for help, meeting Karen and all the other people in the collaborative, um, that passion definitely grew and the ability to serve others grew with it. So seven years later, it wasn't an overnight thing. Uh, we're gonna serve at 34 sites and we're looking at about 3,200 meals a day uh, between breakfast and lunch. So there's a story behind that. And as I mentioned, it comes from the fact that I'm able, and I, and I openly know that I need help and we need to partner up with other people to do these types of things. So I was asked by Karen to join the Summer Meals Collaborative in 2017 and to meet these people and meeting these dozens of organizations allowed me to meet a lot of like-minded politicians, uh, like-minded organizations with the passion to serve kids. So we had California Department of Education there, the libraries, farmers, etc. And then the big key partner with the community leaders is with Center Pan one as the, the best pediatrician in town, um, and the best politician in town, and then Karen as her role as a pastor, just having that uh, knowledge of she's the best person in town that knows what the people are thinking. So she's able to connect us to all these different agencies all around the goal to serve summer meals. Uh, 2012, 2013, all the way 2016, um, what I found out with summer feeding is for the first couple of weeks, it was my best kept secret. In town, I would go around and serve meals, and I'd serve about 20 per day, and no one necessarily knew about it. So taking an idea from um, events, taking an idea from campaigning, it's one of these things where we have to throw events that it's hard to ignore. So 2018 was our first year where we did picnic at the Capitol. It's one of those things where we see thousands of people on the west steps of the Capitol here in Sacramento. Uh, you, have, you have people riding smoothie bikes. You have um, people around a food truck. Um, you have a band playing interactive events. It's hard to, to stop and look at that and go, what are they doing? And as the media shows up as well, they get to see showcase um, all the different school districts throughout our county and see what they're up to. So now we have various school districts joining us. So where last year we had 28 sites, we're serving 34 now. A lot of that I definitely credit to Karen as she's meeting with community leaders, uh, faith, faith faith churches and going, hey, these, pers these people have a need uh, can you service them? Um, we're up to 34. Um, our colleagues in Twin Rivers are serving outside the community for the first time. Same thing in Sac City. Elk Grove, another colleague, is, is expanding. Um, Robla, a neighboring district down the street, is doing their first summer feeding ever 
and even expanding its way outside of Sacramento um, into other parts of the state where people are kind of seeing the benefit of it through the stories that we're telling. So not only is the Sacramento Summer Meals Collaborative a great way to uh, showcase other people's strengths and passion, but it's a great way to tell the stories in different platforms. So with the collaborative um, in Sacramento, in the Thomas Unified itself, we are the second most diverse district in the nation, according to a Time Magazine article. So second most diverse, meaning that um, we have a lot of conflicting interests. There's a lot of people that see things differently, but with the collaborative and the dozens of partners that we have, it's one of the, feeding kids is one of the few um, universal things that people agree on. It's one of the few bipartisan things that people agree on. It's one of these things that definitely um, unite people together. And we do that through the common goal of feeding kids. Um, with the collaborative and just to kind of drive our goals, we separate them in nine. And a few of which, which we'll share is to like match community centers with different service styles. So we sit openly in a table and look at where they are in the region, what service styles we have and match them with the school service, uh, create fun, safe and welcoming environments for students to eat, even sharing resources of what local farmers are growing what and how to source them is a great way, it's a great tool for the collaborative and um, even sharing some marketing techniques. Pretty soon uh, we'll have a driving billboard thanks to No Kid Hungry Go Around Town. And that's just gonna definitely tell our story of us feeding kids. What you see in the picture right on the right is my team next to a food truck. So this year, No Kid Hungry gave us a food truck, where it says Farm to School right there. And that has definitely changed the perception in which we serve summer meals where some kids before have said, hey, that's just for the kids in need or for the, for the um, kids who are poor, the food truck changes that stigma. It makes it a much more festive environment when we're out there with the food truck and there's bicycle blenders, music playing, farmers around it. It makes it just for a fun, festive environment and it get kids off the couch, off from the video games, out to the community centers, out to the pools, um, even enrolling, and we're seeing a spike in the Thomas with summer school enrollment um, because summer meals are there. So as a, um, as a culinarian and as an educator, it is my belief that I'm in the business of teaching kids what they don't know about yet or what they don't love yet and in education, we tend to do this for like fruits and veggies. Uh, sorry, we tend to do this for math and science, but I like to do this with fruits and vegetables. So when kids eat apricots for the first time, or other summer great, another great summer food is when kids eat a ripe tomato, uh, early girl tomato, in the peak of its season in the summer for the first time, um, it definitely makes them healthy eaters for life. Um, so even partnering up with Karen, uh, she does a great job of putting us as um, food service directors and managers and culinarians out there in the forefront, encouraging us to tell our stories. And it definitely is a um, feeding program that's ran by the community. It's the people who grow it are in the community. And then even with that, um, feeding the kids in the community right there. So Picnic at the Capitol was put together by all these sponsors that you see on here. And thanks to No Kid Hungry, um, which is a national brand. USDA was out there, another national brand. Cisco, Foster Farms, all these people, in addition to the community members are saying, we agree, we want to join you in your efforts of feeding kids. 
Um, and we want to help out with some donations and booths and let us help you provide a fun, festive environment for the kids. That's great. Thank you so much, Vince. And that's a beautiful story. And Marietta, I know that, you know, you having worked with Vince and Karen, you've kind of been able to identify some of the really kind of impactful uh, outcomes from this and some of the success factors for collaboration. Uh, would you mind sharing some of those and, and aspects you think might be replicable for other communities? Yeah, I think that, well, first of all, I'd like to say that thanks to us understanding the bigger picture in the community, this definitely allows us to have a credible voice um, when we're talking about any sort of food insecurity issue in, the, in this community. And so this is really what uh, the collaborative and the, com and the partnership has, has done for us as No Kid Hungry, as well as like brand recognition and the fact that, you know, nobody knew who we were when we first, when I first came in here and now people recognize us as um, a, commun a, a huge community, community member and very influential in the area. Um, I think one of the things that you need to do is first find the right partner. <laughs> I think that you could spend your time, if you spend your time doing research, I knew just because I did some listening engagement tours here in Sacramento, that Senator Pan was the person I needed to get to. And um, and so we were very, I was very lucky to have found him really soon into, into this work. And really having the time to devote to relationships. It's going to take, Karen and I have been working for now a year and, um, you know, and, and Vince and I see each other regularly at these collaborative meetings. So investment in time and follow through and making sure that you're consistently um, delivering what you say you're going to do. Um, and I think that those are the things that we're making sure that we have time for when we're initiating these types of um, relationships in other areas. Uh, my colleague in LA is doing the same there and she's, you know, investing a lot of time in the, her in her summer collaborative. And we know that there is interest in San Francisco doing something very similar because they do not have a collaborative in this that, that functions in this way. Um, and so we're starting to to plan that out. That's great. Thanks so much, Marietta. And, um, you know, Karen and Vince, I've got a quick question for you guys. You know, Karen, working with the Office of the California State Senator and, and Vince from where you sit as a food service director within a school district, um, what would be your recommendation for colleagues uh, that are in a similar position who might want to really activate, you know, and do more in their role um, within the community, working with others to expand access to summer meals? Would for me, so I, go ahead, Vince. Yeah, would for me the the one of the first benefits of meeting Karen and Senator Pan's office is seeing how much of a pulse they had on the community, uh, especially with Karen being a pastor. She just knows um, which community, which regions needed what, and how we could better serve them. So. Although as a food service director, I know the industry, um, getting that pulse and getting that insight into um, what is needed in the community, I just, I was fortunate to meet them, much like Marielle, Marielle said, um, but just leveraging some of the resources that they had um, takes summer feeding away from one of the best kept secrets into something that's hard to ignore and the kids definitely go out to and our numbers show that. And I'm going to add to that that one of the things that helped grab the senator's attention and that he used when trying to spread the word to other elected officials was data. And I know that No Kid Hungry and I know all of our Department of Education offices have all of this data available to them. And when I was able to show through a state link the, the amount of kids that were being ignored or underserved or not reached, it spoke volumes to the elected officials. So I would say do your homework and get the data for them. That's great. Thank you so much, Karen. And that's great to hear. And, you know, we've got some additional examples of uh, in real world engagement in action as well with elected leaders getting the word out about summer meals. And on the next slide, we have a few best practices here, and really I just want to highlight a few items that have been consistent, uh, that have been recurring in this conversation is 
really being consistent in cultivating those relationships and making sure that you are doing your homework and preparing for those conversations and having the data at hand to share um, and really keeping a steady drum beat, a, strum, a steady drum beat. You may not get the response you're seeking at first. We know that community leaders and elected officials have a lot on their plates, but that consistency, uh, the ability to have a steady drum beat, and then having that turnkey ask, uh, something that you know Sarah had mentioned earlier uh, about how you know when you have an ask and then you have done the back end work to make to kind of make it easy to, to move on that to make it easy for an elected official to take action uh, they are most likely to do so uh, and uh, on the next slide I want to highlight that we do have some resources to support you in this regard um, and so we have a summer awareness building toolkit which we've released that provides a menu of options for leveraging outreach opportunities around summer meals uh, it's broken down by audience such as reporters social media community outreach, the press, uh, and includes links to templates, best practices, and other resources for engaging each audience. And uh, Sarah Steely, uh, I don't know if you're still on there, but can you talk about, you know, just re-emphasizing how, how much of a difference it makes to really take some of these template materials, some of this existing collateral and repurposing it in order to turn around, you know, uh, specific materials that elected officials can use to activate in the summertime? Yep. Absolutely. So our Virginia local government toolkit is essentially this is a very similar document to this. We just added, you know, some Virginia photos, a nice cut out of the state. But we found that that really resonates with folks because it does have that template language ready to go in there. Um, so we found that we were able to pull smaller pieces of this for our, you know, our short email out to lawmakers. Um, when folks follow up with specific requests, we turn back to this document so that our message remains consistent across all of our, our various stakeholders, whether they're mayors or superintendents or, um, or you know, state and locally elected officials. And then you know, we, this is customizable for other programs too. I know this is a summer webinar, but um, we're able to kind of take materials from this and Think about how we can use them for other programs so we've done similar outreach tactics for for initiatives like national school breakfast week and had mayors pushing out proclamations for that using a similar approach so i love this encapsulated consistent um short and easy resource I, I, it's really reliable thank you sarah and uh just quickly on the next slide as well we know that for folks one of the things that's really come up on today's webinar is the importance of engaging officials whether it's state senators or mayors getting folks to sites for kickoff events, for site visits, for spike events. We also have a planning tool uh, on our website that has you know, template FAQs, press releases, a planning timeline. Uh, and so you can click right on that link and it actually is a tool that really walks you through the nuts and bolts of getting some of these leaders to your sites, which is a great opportunity to raise awareness, generate media coverage, and also really cultivate those champions. Uh, so I also just want to take a moment and just thank uh, Mariela, uh, Vince, uh, Karen, and Sarah for taking time today for our webinar. Uh, this does conclude uh, this month, this series uh, that was began in January. Uh, on the next slide, just want to call out that we will send out a link that includes a recording to all of the webinars, including today's. And then on the final slide, uh, just want to thank everyone for joining us. Again, a very special thanks to our panelists in California and Virginia uh, for the great work that you're doing, uh, and then for taking the time uh, and sharing your passion around this work with our attendees today. Uh, if you need support uh, out there as an attendee and a listener, or you have a great idea or a story to share, please don't hesitate to contact us. And also please subscribe to the Center for Best Practices monthly newsletter uh, for ongoing information on trainings, resources, and grant opportunities throughout the year. Uh, so, Mariela, Karen, Sarah, and Vince, thank you so much. Uh, Emily, thank you for managing today's webinar. Uh, and I'm Derek Lambert, and I just want to uh, hope everyone has a great summer, and that if you do need additional assistance, that you'll reach out to us. We're here for you, uh, and want to wish everyone a great day, and thanks for joining us. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>